Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 98 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Joining me today is James Stayschool. James enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1973 and served for more than 20 years, including with the now famous Special Forces Detachment A in Berlin in the 1970s and 80s, among other assignments. He was severely wounded in Somalia in 1992 and medically retired from the Army in 1996, after which he joined the CIA as a case officer, where he spent nearly another 15 years. Now fully retired from government service, James has written several nonfiction books, including Special Forces Berlin, as well as a new series of novels called The Snake Eater Chronicles. But before we dive into his story, I want to tell you all about my favorite fragrance for daily wear. It's called Novichok by Clandestine Laboratories. Novichok is distinctive and combines notes of cocoa powder, chocolate almond tort, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, tonka bean, Peru balsam, and musk tonkin. Unlike some of the other colognes I've worn in the past, I've found that Novichok stays with me all day, which was a pleasant surprise. If the name sounds familiar to you, then you might already know why I was so happy to find this company and support them. The name itself comes from the very well-known Russian nerve agent Novichok, which has been used in recent years in several assassination attempts, which I've covered here on the podcast in previous episodes. The name is spelled differently, but rest assured, once you put this on, you'll still make a killer impression wherever you go. Novichok is made in small batches by clandestine laboratories and, like their entire lineup, is available only via direct order. If you're not sure which of their fragrances is right for you, you can also check out the Discovery Stash, six different mini bottles at one great price, which is perfect for finding your signature scent. So make sure to check them out, either via a link in the show notes of this episode, at their website, clandestinelaboratories.com, or on Instagram, at clandestinelaboratories. James, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Well, thanks, Justin. It's good to be here. I appreciate it. I've had your book, Special Forces Berlin, on my bookshelf for several years now. In fact, it was one of the very first ones in my new espionage and covert action collection, honestly, but I never thought I'd have the chance to talk to the actual author about it. So here we are, and I'm very glad for it. Well, like I said, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to talk about the book. Great. So it seems like your career is of a type that you would probably not be able to write about it, or most people would not be able to write about it, but ultimately you did. And it was kind of a, a revelation, it seems like, because there was so much information there that virtually no one knew anything about until you published. So what was it that led you to write this book after so many years of silence to begin with? Well, that's really half the story right there. The unit that I wrote about, Special Forces Berlin, was created in 1956, stood up, they say, and it was disbanded in 1990 after the Berlin Wall went down and we had peace with the so-called peace with Russia and the Warsaw Pact. About 20 years after that, about 2010, some of the unit members started to get together, have reunions, and at one point we discussed our history, and someone made the comment that if we don't get this history down on paper, it will never, it will never reach the light of day. The army would never write something like this. They have other, <laughs> other priorities, so to speak. So. I kind of volunteered with the help of some of my friends to to write it and start started out to talk to people about about the book about the history and immediately ran into some difficulties because the unit had been classified a secret our operations were many of them were top secret but one of the big things about it was nobody everybody was a bit unsettled 
scared even to talk about it because everybody signs a non-disclosure agreement and says, do not talk about this. So nobody wanted to talk to me about it. And although Hmm. I had a few friends in the unit that did talk to me, a lot of them would say, no, I can't talk to you about that. I I signed a non-disclosure agreement. So I was sort of between a rock and a hard place. So it got a little difficult there. Hmm. I'll bet. Were you personally like instrumental in getting anything declassified or did you just have to kind of wait out the clock on that issue? Well, there, there is no clock. I mean, 25 years is an arbitrary number that, and it's the government that decides when and if they want to even get around to it. One of the first things I did was I went down to Fort Bragg to talk to the commander of Army Special Forces and I briefed him on my intention he brought out a couple of the historians from the Special Operations Command who were vehemently opposed to me writing this. And yes. you know, they were saying, no, you can't do this. It's all classified. And I said, well, you know, I kind of understand that. There's a process <laughs> here. So I wrote, the, I wrote the story. But the one thing I do have to say is General Cleveland, who was the, the man in charge at the time, was silently nodding his head in one direction while the other guys were opposing me. So I, I took that as sort of his tacit approval. He could not he could not support me in it, but I started putting it together, interviewed about 65 guys, gathered as much of the documentation I could, and then put it together. And as you mentioned, there's a method to get things declassified. And I submitted the manuscript to Department of Defense, the Pentagon, which was a story in of itself. And 15 months later, they came back and said, okay, there's just one or two things you need to take out, but here here you are and go for it. And a lot of people couldn't, couldn't believe it. So 2000... The unit, the unit, the fact that the unit was special forces was declassified in 2014. That's what, 24 years after the fact, but none of their stories were told. So my book, I wrote my book in 2016. It came out in 2017. When the government released my manuscript, essentially they said, this is now declassified. So our missions and everything were out in the open. Hmm. The 15 month wait must have been just interminable for you, but them only requesting a couple of small changes is, is shocking, honestly. Well, yeah. And the, the Department of Defense, to their credit, did their best to keep me, keep me happy the whole time. They would tell me funny stories about other people that wrote books, including one Navy guy who decided that he was not going to submit his book for clearance and ended up turning, turning in the seven-figure royalties that were advanced that the publisher had given him. Oh my gosh. In the end, basically what they do is they take the book apart and they say, okay, this concerns this agency, this concerns a different agency, and they send it out and the different agencies get a, give their approval or not. My book went out to 10 different agencies, so that was part of the problem. Hmm. So, you know, 15 months... I think Hillary Clinton's took like 16. Leon Panetta finally decided to, to have his lawyers call him and say, I'm going to publish anyway. So it was an experience. It has kind of put me off writing nonfiction, but I, I, it's only two years, three years now, and I just jumped back in. So I have another book sitting in the clearance process right now. So we'll see how that one goes. Hmm. Okay, fascinating. Good. Well, yeah, I hope it goes as well as the other one did, even if the weight is is too much to bear. So let's let's talk about the book then. So you mentioned that the organization was created in 1956, I think, and it had several different names that it went by. Which one was, is the one that you prefer, just like Det A or Special Forces Berlin or one of the other names? Special Forces Berlin, I mean, Detachment A is the first era, and then there's the second era, which you mentioned, which I think we had talk about later, but Special Forces Berlin was the official name that was used in all the planning documents. Okay, I got you. And what was the reason for creating this unit in West Berlin at that time? Well, 
West Berlin in 1956, there was a total of about 20, 25,000 Allied troops in the city. And ostensibly, they were just there to keep a presence. Not really any combat power there, but about they started there about 1949, but by that, by 1956, the commander realized that he was probably actually going to be involved in the fighting if a war ever started. And he said, I need some special capabilities. Basically, you need demolition specialists. You need people to do sabotage, things like that. And the only people fit for that operation was special forces. So between the commander in Berlin and the commander of the U.S. armies in Western Germany, they decided to send six special forces teams to Berlin. And that was the start of the unit, 1956. Wow. Okay. So very, very small beginning there, just a handful of guys. And I know that it grew significantly from there, but on the, on the flip side, can you talk about the threat that they were facing, like the number of Warsaw Pact <laughs> troops that were kind of pointed at West Berlin? Because I know it was a lot more than a handful. Yeah, a lot more than a handful. And this is why some people refer to Berlin as the world would be the world's largest POW camp, because surrounding Berlin was what the Russians called the group of Soviet forces, Germany, and then you had the East German army. The East German army was about 800,000 ground troops. The Russians inside East Germany numbered at varying times between 500,000 and 1 million. So our... The ratio was pretty bad for, for all the allies in the unit. I mean, the the French and the British had a few troops. We had our troops, but surrounding us were anywhere from 1.5 to 2 million troops. My gosh, 1.5 to 2 million. Unreal. So do you well, think as time sorry. progressed with, with 40, no, no, 35 years nearly of this unit, do you think that people saw that as sort of like a, a suicide mission or a, a dead end assignment, like doesn't matter how we train, it's going to be over within 48 hours if the Soviets decide to invade. I mean, was that a mentality that existed in your opinion? Well, I, if you look at it as a suicide mission in a negative fashion, <laughs> I don't know how else you could do it. Nobody really thought about it. We, we, we thought that we would have a pretty good chance of accomplishing our mission within the first 72 hours. And then basically we were going to disappear into the, into the woodwork was how everybody thought about it. So everybody was hoping that they would not have to practice the mission, but if it did come to pass, everybody was ready to do it. Hmm. Fantastic. So I, I know that obviously the, the name is special forces, of course, and it requires a special kind of guy, but this seems like an, particularly difficult and dangerous and nuanced kind of assignment for, and you have to have a hard time finding the pi the kind of people that would, you know, survive or not just survive, but thrive in that kind of environment if a shooting war began. So how exactly did they recruit for this organization and who were they looking for exactly? What skill set were they looking for to begin with? Well, <laughs> That's a good question, and it could involve a very long answer. It kind of goes back to the Office of Strategic Services during World War II when they were looking for people that could do the military job well, but could also operate in civilian environments, because that's what we had to do. We were operating in an urban environment. We were in the middle of the city of Berlin, which was about 5 million people, and we had to have basically kind of two personas. One was a peacetime persona where you were a civilian clothes guy and you might may or may not be carrying a weapon, but then you'd have a wartime persona and it would be uniform on and prepared to go to war. There were a lot of people that did not want to do that job. They got to Berlin. You know, some people decided they wanted to go there and they tried it out for a while. They ended up leaving. Berlin was... It kind of a stressful place to live in. It was in the middle of, obviously, it was in the middle of East Germany and it was very closed in. The requirements to travel in and out were difficult. Some people did not like that and they left. But for the majority of us, we adapted to the environment. We were 
living in a city, enjoying it, and practicing practicing what we the skills that we would need to overcome overcome the uh, enemy when and if the war started. And you mentioned demolitions and sabotage and that sort of thing. Was that primarily the kind of work that you would be doing? I mean, was there any anticipated like guerrillas forces that you could lead, you know, in a kind of a typical SF mission? Like were the, were the West Berliners themselves expected to pick, pick up arms at any point? Or was it down to the, the NATO forces in the city and nowhere else and no one else? The mission, the hope was that we would be able to raise a guerrilla army. But initially... The thing about Berlin was it was the center of the railway network for all of eastern Germany. Basically, if you look at the rail lines, they all flow. They come in from the east and they head directly for Berlin. And then they go around Berlin and they flow out in different directions. So it was called the Berliner Ring. And it was really, at that time, it was a... It was a weakness in the Soviet strategy because they relied on rail traffic. So we had teams that were designated to go out and destroy parts of those railways so that the Russians could not move around Berlin and head for Western Europe. That Hmm. was our primary mission, to slow the Russians down, to make sure that the army in the British, French, and American armies in Western Germany had enough time to meet the Russian attack. And so our mission was in the first 72 hours to create enough havoc to try to slow them down. Hmm. So since you mentioned the first 72 hours, it's clear that you have to swing into action immediately. And how did you kind of prepare for that sort of thing? And were, like, were you able to live any kind of a normal life or were you always on 30 minute recall no matter what was going on as an example? We were not on 30-minute recall. It was more like 24 hours because we fully expected that we would have a, a pretty good idea of when when something was would happen. And Berlin was also one of the focal points for American technical espionage, the intercept of Russian radio, of all the Warsaw Pact radios. The amount of information that the NSA and other people were collecting out of Berlin was enormous. So they knew what the Russians were talking about, and they gave us an estimate that they would be able to say when the Russians were actually going to move or attack. And over those those 30 or so years that the unit was there, there were a couple of instances where we would be put on alert And we would be on that short string, that two-hour string or that six-hour string to go to work and prepare for this. But overall, we were fairly comfortable that we would have enough notice that that we could move. That said, we were prepared to move. We were prepared, prepared to go immediately into our wartime mode and not even go into the unit, which was in a military base in the center of Berlin, we could avoid that because we had set up support mechanisms outside in the city and in East Germany where we would have equipment, weapons, demolitions, everything we needed to go to war if we absolutely had to. Hmm. Amazing. Yeah, it's it's hard for me to imagine living that way kind of long term, but I guess that that's what all of you got accustomed to, you know, being on a a high alert status for a, a few days or something like that. seems like you could do it, but it seems like it would be month in and month out. It would be, you know, very, very stressful, like a cloud hanging over you. But I guess that, you know, you had the right kind of people for exactly that assignment. Well, it, it seems that way. Like I said, some people did not enjoy it and they left. It was, it was in a way like almost being kept in a zoo. I mean, <laughs> you only got out, you only got out when the keepers said you could. And, you know, you, you kind of felt like the Russians were just over the wall, keeping a, keeping a watch on you. So, yeah, I mean, even for the people in Berlin, there was sort of a, there's sort of a, a feeling amongst the people in Berlin that, that you were living in a closed space. A lot of Germans who lived in the city did not like that. Many moved out and went to West Germany. But, you know, the majority of the people, you know, they could not. They had to stay there. So it was 
for some a very stressful a stressful time. But I think military people, especially people that have a higher amount of training, tend to adapt well, and the guys that were in the unit tended to adapt well. That said, we probably drank more alcohol than anybody else in the world, but <laughs> that's a different story. Wow. Okay. Well, that's that's a, a coping mechanism that probably helps, certainly, and, and you made it through on the back end, so that's good. Uh, for the most part, yep. <laughs> yep, yep. Especially towards the beginning of the book or the beginning of the, the unit in the late 1950s, there's a lot of references to Lodge Act soldiers. So can you talk about what uh, a Lodge Act soldier was? Lodge Act was a congressional law passed in 1952, I believe, whereby citizens of Eastern Europe, excluding Germans, could join the American military and become and achieve their U.S. citizenship in a matter of, I believe it was, two years. So quite a few immigrants from Eastern Europe, people from Czechoslovakia, people from Hungary, people from Poland, they came to the United States and wanted to serve the American military, especially after World War II, joined the army just to get their U.S. citizenship. Now, mm-hmm. some of those people, a great deal, a great number of them joined special forces because that's exactly what, what we wanted them for. Like the OSS in World War II, we were looking for people that could speak English and native uh, of another country who could speak multiple languages. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we, had, we, we had quite a few of them. Yeah, I know the OSS put those guys to tremendous use behind enemy lines, and and you were certainly behind enemy lines there. So it sounds like those guys were of great use. And I have to assume that some of them were very, very fervent anti-Soviets as well, based on the treatment of their families or their own experiences before they made it into Germany or into the U.S. Army anyway. You have no idea. <laughs> I mean, we even had a few Germans that joined the American Army, and they they were there too. When I first got to Berlin, our senior enlisted guy, a Sergeant Major, was a German who had come to the United States after World War II. He had witness World War II in Germany. He joined the American Army, obviously, because he liked what was over here better than what he liked over there. And our commander, who was a colonel, was a guy by the name of Stan Olshevik. He was from the Czech Republic, or Czechoslovakia at the time, and had was in, in the Czech Republic during the war, and escaped after the Germans occupied Czechoslovakia, went to France and fought against the Germans in the French resistance during World War II. After that, he came to the United States and joined the American army. So for him, it was very, very fervent uh, dislike of the Russians Hmm. and some Germans. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'll bet he had quite a bit to offer the unit with that kind of experience as well. That's amazing. He was a very good commander, and he was actually the man that was leading our assault force during the Iran raid. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I definitely want to talk about that in a a few minutes here. There was a guy, there was a story, a very, very, I guess in retrospect anyway, it was a very funny story about a guy named Wolf who served in World War II in the unit. Do you recall that one off the top of your head? I just read it a couple of days ago. That that, that was, yeah, that was a pseudonym, but right after World War II, almost every year, the United States Army had a, a memorial at, at Normandy on June 6th, and people from the military would be invited to go there, and all their expenses would be paid. And the sergeant major of the unit at that time had fought in World War II, and he knew he was going, and he thought he was the only guy in the unit that had fought at Normandy during World War II. And he announced this in a unit formation one morning and said, who, who else here fought in World War II and wants to go to Normandy? And Wolf comes out from the back of the unit and said, Sir Major, I was there. And he said, Wolf, I, I didn't even know you were in the Army at that time. And he said, I was, but I was on the other side <laughs> fighting for the Germans. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Incredible. (laughs) Incredible. Yeah. I mean, I I know that that certainly happened and that people on the other side, you know, things changed, of course, after World War II, after Germany was defeated. But that's, that's amazing to think that those two wound up in the same unit when they were 
on opposite sides of D-Day, the invasion is unbelievable. Yeah, uh, indeed. Was he, was Wolf also, I mean, was he well-respected? Was, you know, bygones were bygones at that point so many oh, years ago? Oh, yeah. I mean, even, even, you know, the Sergeant Major and the, and the commander, you know, being on opposite sides, they were the best of buddies and it, would smoke cigars together all the time. Mm. So, yeah, no, everybody, I think everybody got along really well. We had a few guys that came in from places like Poland and Hungary and Bulgaria, and they were just all very much happy to be in the American army and happy, mm. happy to be there fighting communism, basically. Amazing. Yeah, that, that does seem like one thing that separates us from any other country that's ever existed, just about, in my opinion. So, James, going back to living and working in West Berlin, I know you guys were rarely, if ever, in uniform. So to what extent did you have to kind of live a cover identity to blend in while you were there? Like, did you have fake civilian jobs or fake identities or or did you just kind of keep a low profile or something else? Well, things changed over the years. It was difficult to, for the military to come up with a, a coherent way to help cover this unit. I mean, we did not hide the fact that we were Americans most of the time. Most of us would say we were civilian employees of the Berlin Brigade. Some people had other stories that they were teachers in the American schools and things, but we did not change our identity from day to day. I mean, we carried an official ID card just to make sure that we wouldn't get in trouble. Some guys did have cover jobs. At one point, I was working as a bartender in a restaurant, but that's another story. <laughs> Many people had apartments in the city on the economy, we used to say, and those would actually be some of our, what we would consider safe houses that we might go to if if war would come and we could initially at least hide out in those locations we had other safe houses that were specifically designated and would never be used during peacetime only used during war so it, it was sort of a mixed bag what we did have though were documentation was documentation that would put us as a either a german or a member a Immigrant from another country, Greece, for example, or Romania or Turkey, who were living in Berlin, official passports and documents that, that would pass Russian inspection, but those were only for time of war. And those were the documents that would keep us out of Russian hands at least you know, for that first 72 hours. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I guess that was the best that you could hope for. I guess nobody really knew what would happen after that 72 hours, as, as dynamic as the events would be, I imagine. Yeah, I, I think so. The, the, we found out the details of the German and the Russian plan to capture Berlin after the wall went down. But it was sort of what we suspected. But they, the Germans, the Russians gave the East Germans the task of capturing West Berlin. And the East Germans plan to use all their secret police and their parachute units to capture the city. So that would have been probably 75 to 100,000 East German troops that would have come into the city to try to capture it. And while 25,000 Allied troops were trying to defend it. So. Hmm. Man, that, that would have been some incredibly tough fighting no matter what I would imagine. And I recall from the book, you said that the, the like hundreds of these Stasi agents would be waiting to sweep up, I guess, huge lists of people that they already had prepared or anybody that they needed to among the populace to kind of quell any dissent or, you know, guerrilla fighting or anything like that as well. Absolutely. I mean, they, they had the methodology and the means to collect lists on people, names, addresses, and everything else. So that was one of the biggest reasons why we had to go with alternative documentation. There were cases of people working for the U.S. headquarters, the British headquarters, and the French who were co-opted by the East Germans to provide information. And so we had, we had no illusions that the Russians and the East Germans 
knew who we were. We were sure of that. Our our saving grace was our ability to disappear. Right, right, absolutely. Now, what a situation. So did you work very closely with any other organizations within the city, or were you kind of kept sequestered so nobody really knew who you were or what you were up to? We worked with a few select units. We often worked with the military intelligence people inside the city, what was 766 military intelligence at the time. We helped them out when they were short manpower, helped them out for surveillance and covering specific actions. I can remember one that we actually covered a meet between a an American who was trying was being recruited by the Russians and uh, he had he had reported everything and there was going to be a big meeting and the Russians were coming into West Berlin to meet this guy and 766 didn't have enough people to cover it so we provided additional people ended up arresting and throwing them back over two Russian generals who had come over to recruit the guy but oh, that that was typical that's amazing we worked with the the military liaison mission, which was basically an overt intelligence collection activity that would send soldiers in U.S. uniform into East Germany just to monitor what the Russians and the East Germans were doing. The Russians were doing the same in West Germany. And so the British, French, and Americans had the same right to do it in East Germany. So we would put some of our people with the USMLM, it was called, and give us the ability to travel in East Germany and see a lot of the area that we would see in time of war. So it was really a valuable asset. We also did work with the German police especially their counterterrorism unit, the Sondereinsatzkommando, or the SEK, which was the West Berlin equivalent of their GSG-9, which is a fairly famous unit. Hmm. So we did, we did work with them, uh, with other people. Most of them were Americans, but we worked with the SEK. Who else? Occasionally, the British Special Air Service, but never inside the city, always out. And... Who else? The SEAL Team, SEAL Team 2, which was in Europe at the time. We worked with them quite a bit. Uh, hmm. yeah. Every day, you're under attack, whether you realize it or not. Your digital devices contain your entire life, your finances, your conversations with friends and family, your interests, and even your movements. And all of that is vulnerable to an ever-expanding class of criminals, scam artists, hackers, and even governments. You don't want to leave your data security entirely in the hands of your ISP, or anyone else for that matter. It's up to you to protect yourself using a multi-layered defense strategy. Silent offers you the protection you need to keep your data and devices secure from wireless threats. Their multi-shield technology blocks cellular signals, GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, EMP, RFID, NFC, and more. Silence lineup includes everything from signal blocking wallets all the way up to 40 cubic liter Faraday duffel bags. When you're geared up with Silent, you'll be truly disconnected, undetectable, untraceable, and unhackable. And you can now use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 to save 10% off your order from Silent. Find them at slnt.com. That's slnt.com. You guys certainly stayed busy. No question about it. Oh, busy. Yeah, busy. <laughs> busy was a, yeah, that's the easy way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So I know that over the years, the, the mission somewhat transitioned or maybe just expanded to include a big counterterrorism role because of the massive explosion of, of terrorist groups in Europe and elsewhere. So can, can you talk about kind of meeting that threat as well as the threat of a, like a East German or Soviet invasion? Yeah, well, I think you, you captured it pretty correctly. Terrorism had never been a serious problem for the United States in the early 70s, but it was a problem in Europe. Very much the 
Palestine Liberation Organizations and some of the other organizations. The German had some homegrown terrorist organizations. The RAF and Bader Meinhof groups were all anti they were anti-capitalist, but they were also very much anti-American. So about 1974, the command in Europe decided that we needed to look at how to fight this problem. And there was no, there was no existing unit that had any sort of a counterterrorism mission. They initially thought it might be a military police mission, but then some of the actions like Munich and some of the uh, operations, the Israeli commandos went on, GSG-9 in Somalia. These were all kind of things that said, no, this is definitely not something that the MPs could handle. Could handle. Mm-hmm. So they said, they asked special forces, they asked Berlin, and said, could you come up with something? Could you come up with a training plan for how to put this together? And the unit had already been looking at some of this stuff. And hmm. we start. We started out by putting out anti-hijacking teams, which were, because the the rage at the time was hijacking airplanes, skyjacking. Mm -hmm. And we proposed this to the command, and the command came back and said, guess what? You have a new mission, along with the unconventional warfare mission, which was to go against the Russians or the Warsaw Pact. They gave us the counterterrorism mission. And the unit began to train for that, 1975 or so. And by 1977, 1978, we were fully operational and prepared to take on take on the mission. So Detachment A, or Special Forces Berlin, was actually the first military unit with a counterterrorism mission. It predates both Delta and SEAL Team 6 didn't even come in until about 1981 or 82, I think. Hmm. My gosh. So how do you prepare for something that's brand new? Did you have people within the unit that had any kind of experience to lean on? Or did you just work with your partner organizations like the SAS and SEK that you had mentioned? Or did you just kind of have to make up something and see what worked? A combination of all those, really. I mean, you you take what had worked for some people and put that together and you try it out. The SAS were one of the premier special operations counterterrorism units at the time. They were extremely skilled in small unit tactics and close quarter battle. What they called close quarter battle was precision shooting for close operating in, in houses and buildings where you would have not only bad guys, but you would have friendlies. Essentially, you had to be able to discriminate and shoot the bad guys while protecting the civilians. So Mm -hmm. they were very good at that. And we had a number of people that had trained with them. We also had a number of guys that had trained up police outfits and special weapons and tactics, SWAT team tactics which was all the rage in the early 70s. We got some training from the Germans, their GSG-9 people, other other things. And we put it together and you know came up with some of our own ideas. We built a shooting house, which was probably one of the first of its kind. And hmm. we were tested in a couple of different scenarios. And although these people... The people who were evaluating us probably had no idea what they were doing because, you know, (laughs) the American army had not trained in counterterrorism tactics yet. The unit was prepared and ready to go in 1978, which was about a year before another famous unit came online, which was, which were the guys at Fort Bragg, Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta, Mm -hmm. Delta Force. Anyway. Long story made probably too long, but that was basically it. So, again, it went from helping out the European command to being one of the nation's dedicated counterterrorism forces. Amazing. So I I know that since you mentioned 78 and 79, we're getting right up to the period of the Iran hostage crisis. And since you mentioned that earlier, can you talk about how the unit became involved in that? Well, yeah, the. The 79, the hostage crisis came down. Delta Force, because it had a larger unit, was the primary designated unit to go help with that. Uh, 
they had about 100 trained people at that time, 1979. So they got the mission to do the rescue or freeing of the hostages that were held in the embassy compound. But Detachment A was also tasked initially to help the Army. I don't know if you remember, but the CIA had no, almost no capability to collect intelligence in Iran at the time. The embassy had been seized. All their agents had gone underground. The officers that were handling them were among the, among the hostages, so they could not provide any, any information. So the Army said, we need to send some people in to tell us what's going on on the ground. And they came to Detachment A because we were the only unit that could provide people that knew how to prepare for a mission like a hostage rescue. But they were also looking for people that could portray themselves as non-Americans. So where better to get these people than some of our foreign soldiers who could be documented as Another, from another country and get sent into Iran. And so hmm. two of our guys were chosen to go in, and they did a very successful mission. They went in several times and collected the information they needed. But during this whole process, Charlie Beckwith, the commander of Delta, said, I can only handle the embassy. There were three other Americans that were being held at the foreign ministry about two or three miles away. And he said, somebody else has to do that. So Colonel Olshevik, who was in the briefing at the time, said, I can handle it. And so the unit got the mission to go along with Delta and take care of the foreign ministry to free the three Americans that were in that, were in that building. And so that was basically how we got involved in it. My gosh. So what, can you kind of walk me through that plan of hitting a, a second site? in the city? Would they, would they fly in with a larger group and then break off at some point and then try to link back up? Or did they have a totally separate like infiltration and exfiltration plan? You hit it right the first time. Our folks would go in alongside Delta Force. The idea was to go into the place called Desert One, which is now infamous, and then move from there to closer to Tehran to a second helicopter site. And then the next night, go into Tehran by vehicles, which had been arranged by our guys on the ground already. They had vehicles and hide sites and everything inside the city. And then the forces would split. Delta Force would go to the embassy, and our folks would go to the foreign ministry and do the hostage rescue. Everybody after that was going to be picked up by a helicopter and flown to a second site where they would be taken out of the country. You know, the Hmm. Delta Force guys, our guys, and the hostages. Okay, okay, I see. Man, that is such an incredibly daring plan. Even now, so many years later, it's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around it, especially for a unit that is just a couple of years old at that point and is on their first mission. So it's it's very unfortunate how it all played out, but it was as just as ambitious and audacious as anything could possibly be, in my opinion. Well, the, a lot of it was taken from an earlier raid, 1972, the Sun Day raid in North Vietnam, which was a, a similarly audacious raid, but a much shorter distance to move. This would have been, I mean, it it put every asset the American military had on the very edge of endurance and anything you could possibly expect from these people. So it was incredibly complex and detailed. And unfortunately, there were just too many weak points in it because so many people were involved, so many different forces, and that's exactly what happened. One, One horseshoe was lost and the raid failed. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's terribly, terribly tragic, unfortunately, but well known now. So, James, were you serving in the unit in Berlin at the time that all this occurred? I was. I was in the unit, and there, <laughs> I remember it quite well because we knew this was going to happen, and we knew there was a very small group that would be selected to go in on this mission. So everybody was kind of... <laughs> 
competing for those spots. In the end, nine people were chosen for, for the mission, one of whom was the commander. So eight people off the teams, eight people out of 95 or so, were chosen. One of the things the unit decided early on, though, was that we would not change our profile. Would We would not change what we were doing, what we had scheduled already. So certain teams, mine was one of them, we trained for the mission, but they said, okay, you have a training exercise to go on in April. You cannot cancel that exercise. So when oh, it man. came down to the time frame and everything, they were saying, well, you're booked, you can't go. Uh, so uh, we were left behind and really upset. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's there's more than one thing going on in the world at any given time. Of course, everybody knows that. And it, it does make perfect sense from, from higher up to not be able to go. But I know that must have been crushing for you and everybody else who was not selected as well. Oh, it you know, it was one of these things like being being chosen to play in the Super Bowl and then being told, no, you've got a dentist appointment. You can't go. <laughs> My gosh. Yeah, that's unfortunate. So after the Iran raid, what happened? I believe there was some some planning for a possible second scenario, wasn't there? Yeah. And the second scenario went from a rescue mission, as I put it, to a punitive raid, basically. The number of people would have been tripled. Our, our part of the force went from nine people to almost 40. And Delta, I think, went from 100 to around 250. So we also, unlike the first mission, we, we had overhead cover, which were AC-130 gunships, just two of them. For this mission, we would have had basically a whole squadron of AC-130 gunships. So, And we were going in a lot heavier, a lot, much many more weapons than, than the first time, I should say. And it would have been very interesting. But it was canceled for a number of reasons, one of which was because Jack Henderson, the journalist, kind of compromised it. He said he heard of rumors that there was going to be a second raid, and that was one thing. But, and this has only come out recently, this was an election year, and one particular, particular presidential candidate apparently had his people negotiate with the Iranians and said, I'm not going to go into it in detail, but basically the operation ended up getting canceled. Yeah, I just saw some reporting on that within the past couple of months, and I don't recall exactly. the details right now, but it's like a like a deathbed confession of one of the guys, I believe, yeah. that yeah. he was involved uh, in delaying the hostage release, right? Right. It was delaying the hostage release, saying that we would not we would not attack them and also provide them with replacement parts for some of their military gear. So, hmm. yeah, man. Yeah, that's unfortunate. That was some very, very dirty politics and it stayed mostly hidden. I guess that was somewhat rumored or somewhat suspected, at least, but stayed mostly hidden until just this earlier this year. I think. Yeah, so, I, well think, over 40 I think years. Just, it was just confirmed, I think, is what what the word is so yeah yeah, um, yeah exactly yeah, yeah, there were, kind of suspected. yeah yeah but you know here we here we are you know 40 years later whatever <laughs> so mm -hmm. here we are yeah yeah the emotions have left most people not everybody i'm sure i'm sure that you got you and and some of the people that you know i'm sure it really struck a chord to say the least with you but a lot of people have kind of moved on from it emotionally the, the populace for the most part well, you know, the it all ended well, relatively speaking. The hostages were released. Nobody was hurt. Our feelings were hurt because we did not get to go on what would have been the greatest operation of that particular moment. <laughs> so, but, you know, that's that's a minor point compared to the overall thing. Right, you know, right now, we're, we're struggling still with the relations between us and Iran. So, anyway... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to go back to you personally then, James. What did you do after you left the detachment? I know that you had a, quite a few other experiences after that. Well, I continued to work in the Army. I did some work. I'm, I'm thinking about how I need to phrase this. I did some work <laughs> with some other units, which really I really can't touch on, but it was basically helping prepare for possible 
contingencies, possible missions around the world, basically going out and looking at things in different countries and help helping to figure out what might be necessary for a military operation in a country, similar to what the guys were doing in Tehran, but a bit different, a bit more modern, a bit updated. Yeah, and I did that for a couple of years. Well, okay, that's that's about as vague as you can possibly get, but it does sound exciting nonetheless. Well, yeah, vague, unfortunately, without, yeah, that's about, about as far as I can go, I think. I, I understand, yeah, there's there's always things that cannot be said with just about every interview that I do, unfortunately, but is there a possibility of another book about that part of your career coming later on, or is that the lid closed on that for the time being? That is probably never going to happen because this is one aspect of the military that has survived over 40 years without being talked about a great deal. And so (laughs) I do not intend to be the guy that (laughs) talks about it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, that's unfortunate. I know you've really piqued the appetite of just about everybody listening right now. So Maybe something will come out. Maybe I know that you were surprised by the pre-publication review, so maybe somebody else will in a similar situation someday soon. That would be nice. I take it that you did some really interesting work in a lot of different places, and it was very formative, certainly. And then can we move on to, I guess, then to Somalia? Because I know that your career changed and your life changed quite a bit in Somalia. So what happened there exactly? Well, Somalia, early early 1992, the, the military was basically getting ready for the humanitarian operation in in Somalia. What would come down is Operation Restore Hope later on in the year. And to not beat around the bush, I say that some of us were sent into the country to take a look at things and help prepare for that operation. So there were American people, American feet on the ground in 1992, well before the Marines came in, um, Mm -hmm. on the 9th of November, 1992. We were there as early as April, and we had recurring visits. My my role started mid-November of 92, and we were there when the Marines landed in Mogadishu and a few other places, so... Hmm. Um, okay. Were uh, you with a different organization than the one we just referred to a moment ago? Had you moved on from there or is it still part of that same umbrella? Let's say what was under the same umbrella. <laughs> okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. So you were, I mean, can you talk about your, your injury or anything in Somalia? I know that that was a, a yeah, big well, transition point for you. Once, once again, as the military started expanding its presence in Somalia, they required information on the best way to get to where they were going. So we were helping them out, showing them the way, so to speak. And on one of our reconnaissance trips, we were driving down a road that, according to local intelligence, was free and clear of anything nasty. And we came to find out that local intelligence was not correct. And we ran over an anti-tank mine, which would have been a little bit less of a problem had we been in a tank, but we were in a regular SUV and basically it tore us up. One person was killed out of four, one person severely injured, me and two other guys badly injured and basically removed me from Somalia. That was late 1992. Hmm. So how long did it take you to recover from all of that? Was that like an obvious and immediate into your military career at that point or was there a road to recovery? There was a recovery. There was an adjustment to my career. It took me a while. They flew us back to Walter Reed, and which is another story in of itself. My injury was to my leg, and it was a basically a catastrophic leg break. I lost about three inches of bone in my lower leg, and they thought they were going to have, have to amputate. But a doctor said, hey, I have an idea. And her idea 
There was a Washington Commanders now. Used to be a different football team who, who had a severe break. And his his leg was treated with a very similar device, which was put onto my leg. But it was basically an experiment for in my case. I managed to keep my leg and I kept on active duty. But my some of my activities were limited. I could no longer, you know, jump out of airplanes. So I was basically cut off from most most kind of field duty but i returned to duty in about november of 1993 1993 december i was overseas again working hmm. you know. so about okay, a year so you were able to get back in the field to a certain extent after that about a year it took yeah hmm. my gosh wow so you were still with the army at that time did you decide that it was time to move on or did the injury eventually catch up to you to the point that you were, you know, involuntarily medically discharged or, or what happened exactly? No, I kept, I kept working the army. I had uh, hopes and desires of getting back, you know, fully in the field, but my leg kept me from doing exactly what I wanted to do. And I had met a woman on one of my overseas trip with whom became close, and her her career was on the upswing while mine had fairly well flatlined because of my rank. There was no, no real place I was going to go. And because of my medical issues, I kind of knew there was only so much more I could do. So I decided to retire at that point. I had 23 years in, and... My soon-to-be wife was going overseas again. She's a foreign service officer. So I said, okay, I'm going to cut ties and go with her. And that's what I did. Hmm. I see. So that, that sounds like a big transition, but at the same time, you're kind of staying overseas and it almost feels like that's where you belong at this point after so many years outside the U.S. I don't think I knew much else, really. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to go into an office job. I never wanted an office job. So this this oh, yeah. was, you know, it was a good place to go. Yeah, I can't blame you for that. So how long did you continue then just with, before you switched to your next career? I retired <laughs> late spring of 1996. I did some schooling, did some technical training. I'm a photographer, so I did some technical training on photography. And then I was getting ready to go overseas with my wife, and I'm looking for a job. So, you know, I, I actually was a stringer for a national newspaper overseas. One day, my wife, who was going overseas, got a briefing from the boys out at Langley. And while she was at that briefing, one of the guys in the briefing hands her a yellow sticky note with a telephone number on it and said, have your husband call this number. So I had worked with them before, and they knew I was going overseas with her. So they basically said, we are very shorthanded in the area where you're going to. Would you like to do some work for us? And I said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I signed on with them. I was a contractor. No. Okay. Okay. So I see. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So was it just like on a, I guess, like a per assignment basis or something like that? Or do they kind of keep you on retainer? Is there any details you can provide on how that works? Well, they, they had me sign a contract and it was for every eight hour period I worked, they paid me money. So, okay. But I hmm. worked almost every day for them. So. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. And did that transition from, from the contract into like full like government service with them as, a, as an official employee, or did you continue as a contractor? I worked for as a contractor for about three years, and then I think they realized they were paying me too much money, and they <laughs> said, "They said, wouldn't wouldn't you really rather be a general service employee?" And I said, "Well, pay cut, but job stability." So I said, "Okay, I'll go with you guys." So that worked hmm. out. I worked with them for a total of thirteen years. Oh, okay, okay, I see. So at this point, I mean, you've you've already done. I guess it's been 30 years or more since you first enlisted. So were you, as a recruit, were you like one of the like older echelon of recruits or were there other people that had full, you know, completely finished up a military career, or foreign service, State Department career, or anything like that when you were going through your training? 
I actually didn't go through training. They oh. hired me. They hired me and said, as far as we're concerned, you're qualified. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I would say so. I mean, you've you've done just about everything there is under the sun. I was wondering what they would have well, to teach you at that yeah, point. I mean, you know, they had provided some of our training in Berlin, and I've gone gone through schools and other things like that. And they said, well, let's. They actually gave they gave me. With a, what would I call him? He was like my buddy for a couple of weeks. And he said, this guy's just going to watch you and see how you do things. And so after after three weeks, he said, well, as far as I can tell, you can do everything I can do. So, yeah. <laughs> so hmm. they hired me. Yeah. Anyway, it was interesting. Yeah. yeah, I can tell. I can tell. That's amazing. So are you able to talk? I know you haven't really written about this, but are you able to talk about what kind of assignments you took on? I mean, was it very... Did it kind of echo what you had already been doing in your previous career, or did you have to branch out a little bit into some unfamiliar territory? I had to branch out into unfamiliar territory. A lot A lot of my buddies from the military joined, worked with the CIA, especially after 2001. But most of them worked in what they call ground branch, which was sort of the paramilitary side. And they kept asking me, why don't you come over and work with us in the PM? And I said, well, you know, I've carried guns for over 20 years now, I'm kind of tired of that. So I, d- I did basically traditional intelligence work, trying to find people who would give me information in return for whatever they needed. And I was a traditional case officer, intelligence hmm. officer. No. Okay. Okay. I got it. Was that, it was obviously a departure, but it was, was it difficult for you? Or do you feel like you took to it pretty naturally? There were parts of it that, that were difficult. I took to it not naturally, but I learned how to adapt myself. One guy said to me, he said, I said, Jim, you're, you are an introvert. If you are going to be successful at this, you need to become an extrovert. So if you can adapt your personality, then you can be successful. And that's what I had to do. So I'm still an introvert, but there are moments hmm. when, when, I know when I have to be an extrovert and when I know, <laughs> you know, you, you have to talk to that person that you really don't care about talking to. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I definitely have not worked in the way that you have worked, James, but at the same time, I, I totally know that feeling because I had to cold approach George Tennant a while back and ask for an interview. And that was a tough <laughs> one for me, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> he said, no, that's unfortunately, a, but I'm yeah, going to wear him down. Uh, that's too bad. Yeah. Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah that's yourself out there if you want to, you know, yeah. talk to people about these sorts of things. That's pretty much how it goes. I mean, you you have to steal yourself and get ready for it. And you know, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. You know, whatever. Uh, I did pretty well at it, and then I, there came a point where I was getting, I was fifty nine years old, and they said, "Well, you're going to have to go someplace that I really didn't want to go." and my wife was going someplace else. And I said, well, we've done enough of that separation stuff. I think I'm going to leave. And yeah. So I did. I retired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very understandable. I'm sure that those kind of careers, that the kinds that both of you had are very, very difficult on relationships when you're not serving together. Yeah. I, I have spent probably... 25 years of my life working overseas and a lot of that was separated from my family. So, Wow. 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 Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So you decided to retire and obviously you've taken up writing. What are you working on right now? Do you have another project in the works, another book? I'm actually, I have one nonfiction book, which is an expansion of the Special Forces Berlin, something I did not cover in great detail. Well, I covered it in some detail, but I'm going to hopefully be putting that out next year. It will talk about Berlin's role in the Iran raid, a lot of it, which has not been discussed. But as we talked about earlier, it's currently in review by the Pentagon, so we'll see when that comes out. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. On their time, unfortunately. I, but that sounds fascinating. Yeah. Those were certainly some of the most interesting parts of the book to me, simply because you, you can't read about that anywhere else, hardly. Yeah, this, this I'm hoping, will also be as interesting. And I continue to write my non or my fiction, I should say. I've got one book coming out probably September, and I'm working on another that will come out next year sometime. So 
Hopefully. Okay, great. The first book in the series was just published. Am I am I not mistaken about that? Very recently. The fiction series was published. Yes. Wow, you know it all runs together at this point. I think <laughs> twenty. 2020, probably 2019, oh, okay. was a question of time, which is about special forces in Berlin in the 1970s. I kind of take what what a famous, I think he's French, a French guy said: fiction is basically the way we tell the truth. And I have taken a lot of what I have witnessed, seen, and experienced. You know, the peace places, people. And the adventures, and am attempting to write about it. And so, a question of time was the first one. I've got three have been published total, and now I have two more coming out. Okay, fantastic. I think people are really going to enjoy that because a lot of people <clears throat> want to read some fiction from someone like you who can really showcase, I guess, skills, abilities, strategies, techniques, that sort of thing in a fictional setting. But I think that they'll be able to gain a lot of insight from that regardless. I'm going to definitely have to link those up as well for people to find the series. Well, I hope so. I, I kind of, you know, there are a lot of fiction books out there that is basically one guy against the world. My take on it is it never works out that way. It's always sort of a team effort. And, mm -hmm. you know, just from my experience, that's what I try to do is bring in everybody that takes part in it. And so it's, yeah, there's a protagonist and, and there's a bad guy, but it's not just about them. It's about everybody that plays a part. So I, I try to include everybody that, that really makes a difference. That's terrific. Yeah, that's a breath of fresh air in fiction, in my opinion. Great to hear. So is there a place that people can connect with you online after they listen to this episode, if they want to you know, get updates or learn a little bit more about you, that sort of thing? Well, I have a Facebook site. Yeah, I, I probably should have a Twitter site, but I, I can't do that right <laughs> now anyway. I have a Facebook site that I post on quite frequently. If you just look at my name and pull it up, James Stasekel, author. We'll talk about my books. I'm also, if you Google my name, you'll get quite a few of my books and reviews. I do a lot of nonfiction writing also about special operations, both modern and early, early 1900s. I go back to World War I writing stuff. I wrote about World War II, a special operations executive in the Office of Strategic Services. But I think the best thing is just to plug my name in and into the internet and go from there. <laughs> Okay. All right. Wonderful. Too easy. Well, thank you, James. This has been really, really enlightening, and I'm looking forward to your next book as well. I just hope that the Army Pre-Publication Board doesn't hold it up too long. I hope so, too. Th thanks a lot, Justin. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Take care. Okay. You too. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.